Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Evo seminar series. Our guest today is Dr. Mazen Kumsia, all the way from Bethlehem, Palestine. Mazen is the founder of the Palestine Museum of Natural History, this really incredible uh, social and research organization, and he is going to present on that and their research and other things. So I will give it to him now. Well, thank you very much, Max. Thanks for having me on this. So I'm going to show a PowerPoint and uh, have uh, people see what, uh, what we speak about, and then we can have plenty of time for question and answer. Uh, so I don't know, do you see the... Yeah, your screen share is on, so you can go to the PowerPoint now. The PowerPoint and put a uh, slideshow and play some stuff. A little bit about me. Um, I was before at Duke and Yale Universities, and I am, uh, uh, I wear many hats. I'm a jack of all trades, master of none, as they say. Uh, but uh, the most, the latest project that we started in 2014 is the, this Palestine Museum of Natural History. Uh, I do want to say a little bit about the political situation as a prelude to speaking about nature because these things are fairly connected. So let me start with uh, why we have a problem here in the Middle East and, uh, or Western Asia as I prefer to call it. Uh, Middle East is kind of a colonial uh, European concept, Eastern, uh, uh, East of Europe basically. But anyway, um, we have a small problem here. It's not very complicated problem as people tend to try to portray it. It's an issue that uh, came to us from Europe uh, with the idea of establishing Jewish state in Palestine. Uh, this idea is called Zionism. And this idea came in the late uh, 19th century. And the first Zionist colony in Palestine was established in 1881. And what this graph shows is the population of Palestine at the time, that 97% of the population was uh, non-Jewish, and there was Jewish population here. The Zionist movement tried to draw European Jews to migrate very unsuccessfully, really, for the first 40 years between 1881 to 1918, basically. Uh, when uh, Jewish uh, Zionist migration to Palestine from Europe started coming, and that's what's shown in the light blue line there. <laughs> and we'll get to why that is, if you want, that they were more successful after. Uh, part of it has to do with the uh, uh, British and the French adoption of the project. Uh, and uh, in 1916, uh, this high Pico agreement, which divided the Arab world into um, the uh, uh, basically spheres of influence for the British and the French. And this was followed in November 1917 by declarations in support of the Zionist project by the French government, uh, issued by their foreign minister, Jules Cambon, and by the British government. In 1915, uh, Belfort. Uh, many of you probably heard about the Belfort not conduct. And according to the Sykes Pico agreement, Palestine came under British rule after this, the First World War. And so it was the British who were charged with implementing a declaration in support of the Zionist project. Now, as I said, when this happened, a tiny minority of the population here was native Jews. Most of the population was non-Jewish. And the idea was to create a Jewish state in this area. And uh, obviously, this could not be done uh, nicely. You could not purchase enough land. You could not immigrate enough people. Uh, the only way you can do it is by the point of the gun and by removing the native Palestinians. And every single uh, Zionist leader in the 18th century and, uh, I mean, late 19th century and early 20th century 
thought that uh, was necessary and, and a condition for doing this is to basically remove the native people. And this is what eventually happened with the uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestine, 1948, 49, and 1950, when 500 um, plus Palestinian villages and towns shown on the map on the right in the red dots were wiped off the face of the map. Today, there are 7 million of us are refugees or displaced people, 7 million Palestinians. Uh, this is a distribution of Palestinians in the world today, 12.7 million total population, uh, of which in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And by the way, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are about 22% of Palestine that were not uh, occupied when the State of Israel was created in 1948. They were occupied in the second stage of Israeli expansion in 1967. And with then, in the US, we have 20 percent population. And then Arab countries, 44% of the Palestinian population, and so on. As I said, this was Bank in Gaza in 1967 and proceeded to build uh, settlements, is Israeli colonies, if you want, in those areas. The map on the right is, uh, shows the names of the major West Bank. And today, in the West Bank, there are 750,000 Jewish Israeli settlers. Uh, there's actually more Israeli settlers in the West Bank. There's Israel, so to speak, the area that was occupied in 1948, uh, 750,000. Here are the settlers, are you can see the Jewish Just today, I had volunteers here uh, to the Plifukin and those areas over here on the western. the green line which lost much uh, the Palestinian as a threat now we are using you one small interesting history and this is colonialism of course is to do it slowly and meticulously with stages and the map on the top shows how the uh, range of the Palestinian areas have shrunk. Basically, the to be an actual end of the land. Uh, in 1492, when Columbus so-called discovered America, we uh, have moved in there. Colonialism is important as it for environmental and many other issues. And also because making the right diagnosis is important when you use. If you confuse the symptoms with the diagnosis, uh, you are liable to give the wrong therapies to this. Colonialism is the name of the game for most countries. Actually, it's a a promising and optimistic diagnosis because most countries have moved to a post colonial era uh, relatively peacefully, if you want. I uh, think South America, Central America, Caribbean islands, uh, Mexico, Canada, if you want, and uh, Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, Philippines, uh, South Africa, certainly. You know, there are many countries that, that went through colonialism and have moved past that to an era where people who are colonized people, the native people, plus the colonizers, uh, learn to live together in one country. Um, and, and this is the, the uh, direction we are moving. In the interim, of course, you can understand 
the perspective of the colonizers and the perspective of the colonized. Colonizers, they come to these countries uh, not saying we want to kill people or whatever. That's not their objective. Their objective is to establish a new state to run away from discrimination, for example, in Europe. Uh, when the uh, early colonizers of North America came there, uh, they said for religious freedoms and uh, opportunities to be pioneers, if you want, to bring technology, science. Um, you can see this image, for example, of North America, technology, trains, uh, etc., uh, agriculture, modern modes of agriculture. Uh, to a primitive land, if you want. That's a self-perception. Uh, and the native people, of course, run away, uh, just like the wildebeest and everything else, uh, runs away because it's dark continents, for example, the perceptions in South Africa of the dark continent, etc. Yeah. Mazen, can I interrupt you for a moment? Savages that in their blood, they are not. Hey, Mazen. Yeah. Um, we're having some audio issues. Uh, is it possible that we could ask the other people in the museum to? not use the internet while you're presenting um is that is that too big of a of a an ask no that's fine okay yeah because okay. we we Can lost you yeah, you yeah it, it comes and it goes we lost like the last two or three minutes of of what you were saying um i repeat basically the perception of the colonizers is understandable or understood at least, and the perceptions of the native people is of course also understood. Uh, from their perspective, the colonizers are people who are they're stealing the land, changing the, our way of life that we have practiced for thousands of years, etc. Uh, so this is basically where, uh, now I have my computer frozen, I cannot change. Okay. Uh, why? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. But I can't change the PowerPoint. Why? That's interesting. Let's see if I can solve this problem. Uh, can we try just talking? You cannot move any. Try hitting Command Q. Command Q. It's about a Mac. This is a Mac, but uh, don't move. Do you have a mouse, Jesse? Can you get a mouse? It's very strange. No mouse there. there. Mm. We are no stranger to technical difficulties here. Happens frequently. No, I can't at all move anything. It's frozen. The screen is frozen. Um, <coughs> Control option. Control F. Yeah. No, it's frozen completely. So we will have to restart. All right, we will we'll wait here for you. The the URL is still the same, so just come back when when you are when you when you can, or or maybe switch to another computer if that's no the power. Anyway, yeah, we'll wait.
here. I'll, so I'm going to unmute the students. How, how much of, of that earlier part of the presentation were you able to get? I was able to hear um, probably 80% of it, something like that. OK. Yeah, yeah that, that was, I that's, got what he was saying. Okay. Mostly. Yeah, I, got <clears throat> I got the general gist of like what he was talking cool. about. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it'll it'll improve once the restart happens. Um, yeah, so I was I'll I'll turn on my my camera. Um, I was at the museum last January. Um, I was there for for a little less than a month, and uh, they do they do some really innovative stuff. Um, they do like these very simple biodiversity studies. Which I expect Mazen will will talk about in some detail. You folks, you folks read those papers that I sent out, the one on on frogs and um, the one on I think it was butterflies, frogs and butterflies. Yeah. So so they do they do this like you know empirical research going out and and documenting biodiversity in Palestine, but it also has this really strong social mission, um, which which Mazen was was describing first. Uh, Mazen, are you still here? Gone. All right, Mazen is back. Welcome back. Thank you. Sorry about that. It happens. I I, I kind of expected, you know, because the internet in Bethlehem is not not super strong, so I sort of expected this would happen. All right. So let me see. We'll go back to this. So. Um, you see the slide now, it's about yes. South Africa. Yeah. About 11.5% of the land uh, dedicated to the Bantu styles, to the black uh, areas. In the case of Palestine, the areas that are, are dedicated to us are these areas in the Galilee, in the Triangle, in the West Bank, in the Negev and in the Gaza Strip, and together those are 8.3% of the land. And there's obviously institutional uh, discrimination uh, that is ongoing. For example, this picture just illustrates one aspect of this, that Palestinian refugees are not allowed to return to their homes and lands, whereas any Jew in the world, any convert to Judaism even, is welcome to come here get automatic citizenship, live on stolen Palestinian land, and freely move about. Um, OK, this is kind of a, a brief description of the history. It's relevant for what I'm going to talk about, which is the um, environmental aspects and the fact that we use the museum as a form of resistance in here. Now, resistance uh, to colonial rule is uh, understandable. Uh, for example, this is the late 19th century leaders of Palestinian nonviolent resistance, like Ruhi al Khalidi and uh, Hafez Abdel Hadi, led nonviolent demonstrations against uh, the, the Ottoman Empire giving the Zionists a foothold in Palestine. Now, I want to be clear that we Palestinians don't have a problem with immigrants. Uh, Jewish or otherwise. For example, when the Armenians came here in the early 20th century uh, after the Armenian Holocaust, and by the way, the word Holocaust uh, came first usage for it was with the Armenian Holocaust, uh, which was done by the Ottoman Empire. Many Armenians left uh, Armenia, came to Palestine. They settled here. We even gave them a quarter of our capital, Jerusalem. So there's an Armenian quarter. 
when the Jewish uh, uh, Russians were discriminated against and there was Russian pogroms in the 19th century, they were also welcomed here. I have no problem with that. We do have a problem with the Zionist ideology, which is about transforming a country that's multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural, uh, to make it the Jewish state of Israel. That we have an issue with because obviously it excludes the natives in the same way that, uh, you know, American, Europe, European American colonizers excluded the natives and killed them and, and took their land and changed the way of life that they had practiced. So this is why we resist. And this resistance continues from that era in the late 19th century until today because and this is an important point. All colonizers do this. They build on the one hand and destroy on the other hand. They build a new reality for themselves, of course, with new cities. Hence, in uh, America, you hear of New York, New Haven, new this, new that. And, uh, and uh, you know, of course, that's relative to where they came from, New York for York in England etc. And so they build on the one hand, but they also destroy on the other hand. They destroy a native way of life. And this destruction is ongoing. Hey, even in the past week, there were home demolitions, uh, uprooting of trees like these ancient olive trees that are 2,000 years old, etc. This is natural. Uh, as I said, not, uh, again, I don't want to appear like, you know, I don't want to talk about good people, bad people, there's no such thing. You know, there are people who do bad things to us as native people, but they're not bad people. They do it sometimes with good intentions, uh, whatever, I don't know, but that's their motivations. As I told you, there's a narrative of colonialism and there's a narrative of the colonized people. You, you can believe whichever you want to believe. Uh, I mean, sometimes, I mean, if you think of the blacks in America, they were discriminated against. Some blacks resisted discrimination, majority of blacks resisted. People like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Edwin Douglas, etc. But there was thought the answer to discrimination is to go to Africa. And they had the movement by that name, Back to Africa. And then they went to Africa and they picked a place in West Africa and they named this place Liberia and they created a new country called Liberia for liberty. So you may think of good intentions, they're running away from discrimination, whatever. But the problem, of course, is that Liberia was not a land without a people for a people without a land. And so the native people of Liberia suffered uh, horrendous injustice by this process of ethnic cleansing, removal, control, etc. Here we are, uh, this continues, this destruction of native lives continues, and we pay a very heavy price for it. Um, I myself, uh, since coming back from the United States, I'm a US citizen, by the way, in 2008, my wife and I came back, to live here where I was born. And um, since then I lost 18 of my friends in the struggle. Uh, this is, uh, for example, on the left is Basim Abu Rahma who was killed by tear gas that crushed his chest, tear gas canister that they shot at him directly and crushed his heart. And I went to his funeral and, um, and also later to his family home. Uh, his sister Jawahir, which you see on the right hand picture, uh, she basically uh, had um, <coughs> um, had um, had uh, showed me his room, which they have kept as it was, and uh, she herself was killed by inhaling tear gas at a demonstration. This is the last one I lost, is uh, uh, Basil Laraj, who was killed in nonviolent resistance. Um, he was arrested with me, for example, when we tried to ride the bus. And this is me being arrested a few times. 
Okay, this is the second segment. I, I wanted to set the context for what I want to talk about, which is um, now we talk about what is the effect of the colonial occupation on nature and uh, why what we are doing as a form of uh, resistance at this museum. So the museum uh, has a the mission of rich and conservation for myself for motto for others and respect for nature self-respect in the sense that we can change our own circumstances uh, and this is empowerment basically and so the articles i asked you to read for example about uh, biodiversity and uh, and how uh, related to these things under conditions of colonialism is important. We have Earth, it's one Earth I put in this, uh, we're a small part of the universe, of course. And if you collect the air and the water on Earth, it's very small. For all, why it's very important. Now, um, and it's important for us to understand these connections of humanity and when we talk about environmental conservation, climate change, uh, risk of war now, of course, nuclear war. Uh, I mean, you can think about human species now. Uh, we cannot afford to think as nations or as countries, if you want. We have to start thinking globally. Globally, there are two factors that could result in the extinction of the human species. One is nuclear war, and the second is climate change. I'm not going to talk in detail about any of these things. But since we, you wanted to hear about Palestine, the issues that face us here, we are part of the Fertile Crescent, and we are very lucky in being part of the Fertile Crescent this is where humans first developed agriculture, where we first domesticated plants and animals. Plants like wheat, barley, lentils, chickpeas, hummus, if you've ever had hummus. And animals like goats and sheep and donkeys and camels and so forth. They're all domesticated in this fertile crescent. And these people who domesticated these animals and plants was uh, described by archaeologists, one lady actually I met her, uh, described it as the Natufian period. Natufian from Wadi Natuf in the north of Palestine. And Wadi Natuf is where these first uh, agricultural communities developed. Uh, the more proper terminology in terms of civilizations that came after that is the Canaanitic civilization. You may have heard it pronounced Canaan, land of Canaan in the Bible. Uh, land of Canaan is uh, the, uh, basically the area of the Fertile Crescent. And these Canaanites, or Canaanites, if you want a more proper pronunciation, Aramaic, um, are people who domesticated, uh, and this is their depictions, by the way, by various civilizations. These are our ancestors, basically, and here you see the old, older pictures a hundred years ago, what uh, my ancestors dressed, how they dressed. They actually had different costumes for the different towns and cities, um, and these are the native people of Palestine. The native Palestinians have a rich uh, cultural and and linguistic and traditions, etc. Our language, by the way, is uh, Arabic mixed with Aramaic. Arabic, by the way, is an uh, evolved language of Proto-Aramaic. Proto-Aramaic gave rise to Arabic and it also gave rise to Hebrew and other uh, things. This rich agricultural traditional heritage also, a rich linguistic heritage, as I said, is very important, and the museum works to, um, to preserve this rich ethnoecology, ethnobotany, ethnozoology, etc. This is, for example, 
Palestinian village in the north. One of those villages that were destroyed by Israel when it was created, which no longer exists, it's in the Galilee. Uh, this is the evolution of the alphabet. You can see uh, Aramaic, uh, how it evolves uh, into the Hebrew and the Arabic alphabet. Um, and actually, even the alphabet that you use in English comes from Latin, and Latin uh, alphabet uh, comes from the Phoenician Aramaic. The A, for example, comes from Aleph, which is the bull uh, uh, with the two horns. You put it on its side or, or upside down, you get the two uh, legs of the A, if you want. The B is from Beit, which is a house, the shape of a house, um, etc. So we are lucky in being part of this, uh, um, of this land that has given so much to human civilization, including the alphabet that you use, the agriculture, first agriculture, wheat and barley. When you drink a beer, think of us because the wild barley is here. When you eat a loaf of bread, think of here because that's where the wild wheat is that was domesticated in these areas. But we are also lucky in that being at the cross road of uh, Eurasia with Africa, we have 500 million birds that migrate through Palestine annually. And we have very rich biodiversity in a very small area. And I won't have too much time to go into all the richness, but relative to other countries the same size, Palestine is very rich in biodiversity. For example, uh, Palestine has over 3,000 species of plants. Uh, Germany has uh, 3,200 species of plants, I think. But Germany is about 40 times the size of Palestine. So, um, now we have an issue, of course, in, uh, in protecting our environment because uh, in third world countries, as you know, um, poverty is very high. Um, now, Palestine is not a poor country, it's not really a third world country. Before 1948, most oranges in Europe were uh, coming from Palestine. Before the State of Israel took our oranges, uh, Jaffa oranges, which now a trademark that they have stolen from us, basically like everything else. Uh, most European citrus used to come from Palestine in the 1920s and 30s, from Palestine farmers along the coast. Uh, so we were a rich country with tourism, everything else. But of course, our economy was destroyed. So we are, um, we stepped back into a third world country. And Palestine now has a per capita income. I mean, I shouldn't say Palestine. The Palestinians who remain in Palestine, slash Israel, if you want, because now it's all called, called Israel. The Palestinians who remain here have a per capita income of about uh, $3,200 a year GDP. So if you want to put us on this graph of uh, per capita, we would be in the lower left-hand corner as per GDP in terms of thousands. It's like, uh, I don't know, BG is Bangladesh, I guess. And uh, uh, I don't know what the other, Rus Russia is up there a little, also weak per capita income. Uh, but anyways, Israel, of course, uh, and I think Israel is listed, IL there. This is an old graph. Actually, Israel is now 30,000 uh, GDP. Obviously, what this graph is trying to show is that the more per capita income you have, the more you have environmental concern. And that makes sense, of course, if you are a poor uh, child in uh, Bangladesh or India and you're starving, or, or Gaza, for that matter, uh, and there's a bear, then you can shoot it with the slingshot, you're going to shoot it and eat it. Uh, your environmental concern is going to be lower. So I put this graph to illustrate that we have huge challenges in protecting environment when the economy is so bad. Um, but I wanted to also talk about the impact of the uh, 
project, the Zionist project on Palestine environmentally. One of the first projects that the State of Israel did when they were created as a new state in 1949 was to start draining the wetlands of the Hula wetlands, which were very important for migrating birds. Of this drying up of Lake Hula and the wetlands around Lake Hula, uh, basically 119 species disappeared. Seven became Came locally extinct. The wetland, the Hula wetland, is in the north, basically over here. This is the area they dried up. And then the second project they did in the 1950s was divert the water of uh, Lake Tiberias, the headwaters of the Jordan Valley, basically here, um, to the western parts of the country. Because Israel didn't control the West Bank, as I mentioned earlier, the West Bank was occupied in the second stage of expansion. And this diversion of the waters of the Jordan Valley uh, resulted in the drying up of the area of the Jordan Valley and desertification to spread into the Jordan Valley. Also, the Dead Sea started shrinking, as you see here. Used to have all of this, used to be. Dead Sea is actually a lake. They call it Dead Sea because its salinity is high and there's no fish or anything like that. And there are bacteria and algae and things like that that are around the Dead Sea. But anyway, the Dead Sea is shrinking and uh, has shrunk significantly. And this had huge environmental impacts. This devastating project for the environment. It's also economically not very good project, but it's propaganda wise it was useful for Israel that they made the desert green. They really didn't because these areas, the coastal areas, always had very good rainfall and had very good agriculture. As I said, with citrus uh, being produced in these areas and exported, there's plenty of water in this part of the country. Uh, and, and so it didn't really help agriculture, but it was a good propaganda effort and also a good political project in terms of drying up the Jordan Valley when Israel didn't control the Jordan Valley before 1967. They didn't control these areas. As the Dead Sea is shrinking, Israel has moved to try and quote unquote remedy the problem of the shrinking Dead Sea. The problem, they are building a pipeline and a, a canal, if you want, that will take water from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. And this canal will have basically uh, reservoirs, uh, hydroelectric plants, desalination plants. And desalination plants will desalinate the water of the Red Sea. And then what's left, the effluent, basically will be dumped into the Dead Sea. This is a very horrible idea, by the way, uh, environmentally, because you have to pump water up here and then dump it down and then get this. And this is in the Rift Valley, basically, where there's high wake potential, because we are on the Rift Plate between the Great Rift Valley, which runs from uh, Turkey, or through Jordan Valley, Arab Sea, East Africa. This is the Great Rift Valley between the two tectonic plates of Asia, the and Asia, which is the Arabian plate and, and the African plates here. And this is very prone to earthquakes. So it has huge problems. I don't have time to go through all the cover up of the impacts. The government of Jordan, the government of Israel did. Uh, with the environmental impact study done by uh, companies that are consult and all of this stuff, which is uh, horrible to the uh, ecological impact that that will have. Um, another problem that we face here besides these mega projects that are done that all the environmental groups, by the way, Israeli environmental groups, Palestinian environmental groups, Jordanian environmental groups. Uh, there's not one single environmental group that says these are good uh, mega projects, but they are 
being implemented, as in the case of the Red Sea, Dead Sea Canal. Uh, but we do face other uh, challenges besides these mega projects. Uh, for example, uh, climate change, we expect uh, rainfall to drop by 20, 25% and temperatures to rise by 2 to 4 degrees centigrade and we're already feeling it here. Uh, it's incredibly hot here, uh, more than usual. Now it's 4 degrees for this week, for example, more than the average years. We have many other challenges. I don't have time to go into all of them. Uh, water is an issue, of course, uh, not that we have a shortage of water. As I said, uh, we have plenty of water. Uh, Israel diverted the Jordan Valley waters, as, as I mentioned. But even with the diversion, there's plenty of rainfall here uh, that would uh, give us plenty of water. Ramallah, for example, gets more rainfall than London we have an equal distribution. Most of our water is taken by the colonizers, as you see in the graph here, and the native people in the West Bank and Gaza Strip get less than what the World Health Organization recommends for healthy living. Gaza is already unlivable. This is a European, uh, I mean, uh, EU, uh, United Nations report that was done in 2012 it says Gaza will not be livable by 2020. This report was done in 2012. We had in 2014, uh, Gaza was invaded, attacked, uh, its infrastructure destroyed, its electricity, power generation plants were destroyed, its uh, sewage treatment facilities were destroyed by Israel. So Gaza is already unlivable, and there's actually genocide ongoing in Gaza. I'm sorry to use this terminology, but it's real. People are literally dying in Gaza. Diseases that can be treated or dying of malnutrition, uh, etc. Now, I don't want to depress you guys <laughs> too much. Move to respect to what we can do and what you can do to help us and how we can work together to address environmental issues, biodiversity issues. I think the biggest thing is knowledge, and we have to start with knowledge. And what you are doing here in, in the talk that Max and organizes these talks, I think is the most powerful thing. Knowledge is power. You can use knowledge to affect change in behaviors. Uh, with knowledge uh, in my career, I went uh, when I was uh, Actually, a student, I start tried to read books. Student at high school and middle school, I, I was very curious about knowledge and research. I published my first research paper when I was an undergraduate student. And so um, I believe research and knowledge is power. This is a research paper that I did in 2012 on the status of research in the Palestinian areas compared to other countries need knowledge. So now we publish a lot of papers in the museum. Now, uh, one of the papers I asked you to read is Decline in Vertebrate Biodiversity in the Bethlehem Region. I hope you got a chance to at least browse it. Uh, it doesn't have any figures, but this is what I mean by decline in vertebrate biodiversity. When you have an area that used to look like what you see up there in 1997 and what it looks like today at the bottom with an Israeli Jewish only settlement that's right here. Uh, we can see it from, from the museum here. This obviously has an impact. And we studied this impact with that paper that I asked you to read. We did a paper on uh, the diet of the uh, eagle owl. eagle owl. Because the owls, you know, they eat their animals intact. They regurgitate the, the, in the owl pellets, the bones. So you, you can look at the, the owl pellets that are deep, whereas the newer ones at the top of the heap. And what we saw is a significant uh, decline in the diversity of the animals that these two owls ate at that site. 
and uh, and it was now they eat mostly rats basically owls live long years by the way so this nest is probably 40 50 years old 40 50 years there was a decline in these things it work on genotoxic effect of israeli industrial pollutants because they put their most polluting industries uh, near palestinian areas and uh, and this is uh, and this study showed that the, basically dna damage and chromosome breaks in humans and it obviously also impacts other animals and plants in the area this morning i took two of the volunteers uh, here with us to uh, to uh, uh, hebron where they had a conference about electronic waste and the, how it impacts the environment as a new project actually they, they received european funding for this we had published the paper um, uh, earlier this year in the spring about the effect of recycling electronic waste on the human population with uh, again dna damage chromosome breaks Let's it again. can you still hear me hello sorry i was muted yes we can still hear you are you frozen again yeah i'm frozen again. Okay. i think i probably should stop using this uh this powerpoint for some reason it freezes on the powerpoint well, is there any way to, to get out of the screen share? Uh, yeah, I can't, though. I have to restart the computer again. Okay. Uh, but we can talk if you want. And uh, I think maybe I said most of what I want to say. Yeah, um, well, it would be good to, to restart so that we can have your video feed. That's, that's worth waiting the couple of minutes it takes. Okay. All right. I'm sorry that this presentation has been so technically fraught. So it goes. Mazen, are you still there? No. Oops, I'm muted. Uh, Maximus. Yes. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> it's going okay. How's how's Harvard? Good. I'm you know, I've not, I've I've been on the phone with tech support at various universities, probably twelve times in the past week, but that's how it goes. You're in a different. I drew way. eyes. Let's see. Oh whoa! Is that <laughs> just a big whiteboard? Yeah. Big big brother is watching you. Oh no! It's um it's a glass wall actually, so you can see it from the other side too. It's cool. Um, I'm glad this is this is a really beautiful talk, and I'm glad he's not. I um, I love how deeply tied into its context it is i love how it's not 
trying to decontextualize itself. Yeah, I mean, the, the museum, it, it really, when I was there, it, it struck me as, as, as far as research institutions go, because it's so, it's so integrated with, with its, its social context. Um, and you know they're they're going out to all of these places and and the studies that they're doing i mean the genotoxicity study was actually quite interesting and i'd never seen something like that before but even then it was just they were getting dna samples and and looking at them and the body like it's all very simple like simple research compared to compared to the stuff we've seen earlier like what what jessica was doing or what molly was doing um using like fairly sophisticated statistical techniques and whatnot but but they're doing this work that that just isn't being done and and so they're they're relating to this land that is so fraught um in in you know using using a different kind of language a different different language for advancing an activist mission and um i think it's really special so working at at a level closer to the ground it's it's working at a more descriptive level and more narrative mm -hmm. level than the the computational or yeah and it, it really struck me because i was like oh my goodness this is biology like we went out every day and we gathered snail shells and we counted the snails <laughs> and then the number of species and like i feel like when i started biology grad school that's what i had thought it would be like, or, or I don't know. I mean, just like that, that there's, there's a really, really strong focus on actively relating to the living world that they're studying. Um, and you don't see that in many Western biology departments who are, are focused on, you know, they're, they're, they're answering really important questions, but, but it requires a certain amount of abstraction that um, M and H is not doing. David, how are you doing there? You've you've joined and left a number of times. Comes and yeah, goes. Yeah. Okay. Working. All of them work, so I put it on my computer, and now I just kind of have like a little rogue account sitting there. So just ignore it. Okay. Uh, I may have to boot it. Hopefully, the, we have yeah. a of ten. One, yeah. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. Ten. Please do. I can't do it on my phone. Okay, yeah, um, maybe I will. I will eject. Cool. Okay. Hey, um, oh, yeah. Hey, yeah, I was just thinking about the kind of connections that I'm trying to make between, say, Jessica's uh, research in, you know, kind of mitigating the environmental impact of human beings living in a community that has traditionally had like a certain amount of wetlands or, you know, obviously the comparison is so drastic because the environmental impact that we're seeing in Palestine has, a, seems to have a huge effect with such large numbers of people coming into the, you know, a community and totally devastating the landscape. But there's a certain very loose connection that I'm seeing between the type of direction that Jessica's research was and like just looking at one thing, specifically road salts or whatever. Um, and then, um, I'm sorry, what's his name? Mazim. Mm -hmm. Mazim's uh, research, obviously looking at more devastating impacts, but it's still trying to figure out what are the impacts of, or what are the the, the, the ecological consequences to these socially devastating um, po and politically um, motivated, you know, human interactions with nature. It's incredible. Yeah, well, th that, that connection is actually quite strong. And as soon as I got back from, from Palestine last winter, I scheduled a call with Mazin and Jessica. Uh, and and she, was, she, was, she gave some advice about different experimental setups that they could do um, to study the effect of salt on amphibians in Palestine. And I, I want to um, put together a, a research trip out there next, or probably in, in 18 months. Um, and I talked with Jessica about going out there and, and doing some toxicology studies there. Because she has, she has a certain, she has methodologies that are more sophisticated than, than, than what the museum is doing. But their research topic is, is very closely aligned. 
sophisticated. I mean, yeah, it is more sophisticated. She's got more tools. Fancy tools, more money, less political strife. <laughs> Uh, Maximus, how did you uh, end up going up there? How did you find the museum and, and the, the Maxine, or Mazine, sorry? Um, it, was, it was my partner, Rachel. We, she, uh, she was going to Israel on birthright. I mean, that's this irony of, yeah. of these policies. It's like, you know, she's, she's half Jewish. Uh, like has no no real relationship with with that with much of anything, but but there's an organization that will pay three and a half thousand dollars to get her in touch with her homeland, and so she she took the the, the free trip, and then uh, we we went to Palestine afterwards, um, and she she just found them on Google. I think she was googling like permaculture in Palestine. Rena, except not Rena. It's just Rena's computer. Mazin, is that you? Maybe perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. All right. I have a question. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep my mind is going a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So I mean, let's talk about it. You know, until until so they like, keep talking. All about right. It. I I don't want I want anyone else to jump in, but I'm gonna jump in if no one's gonna say anything. Um, this idea of dual narratives is interesting, you know, like the, the narrative of the colonizers and the, na the narrative of the colonized, you mm -hmm. know, the narrative of building something and the narrative of that being destroyed, the narrative of um, someone going on birthright and then flip that around and they're going to see the other end of that spectrum. Okay, what is actually happening on the other side of this border, you know? So is there a place for, for dual narratives in science? That's the question. Is there yeah. a... I mean, Mazda... my favorite talk. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's a, a crash course video that maybe I'll send you folks uh, that does a really good summary of, of the, the Israel-Palestine conflict. And, and like the, the thesis of that video is that you know, the, the conflict is on an abstract level caused by a consistent inability of each side to recognize the other's narrative. And, you know, Mazen is a, a, a fairly polarized person. He's going to give you a polarized narrative, but it's a very well-educated and, and balanced polarized narrative. I don't, I don't know exactly. How, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, there, there are many, many stories about this region, and they're all true, even when they, when they cause conflict or maybe even appear to contradict, and it's it's very difficult to to suss out. Um, but, but I, I I'm I'm glad that that we're trying, basically. Yeah. So this is something that has been really fascinating me recently. I've been thinking about this a lot recently because we have today, we're facing an environmental catastrophe on a global scale. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a catastrophe that's a catastrophe that our species faces and, and the survival of us, of life. Um, as we know it, or or even life <laughs> in general depends on that, and um, yet we can't that uh, awareness onto all of humanity, right? Um, and how do we move forward as humanity facing that when that isn't a reality that exists for much of us and and it's hard and I and I think that part of it is that the um, modern Western scientific empiricist liberal um, 
view does in fact exclude a lot of other views. Um, so how are you going? Yeah, I mean, how are you going to get? Like, look, we have all these Trump voters. How are we going to get them to care about the environment? To the the media I see is mocking them. The media I see is is trying to you know force them to just look at the data. And it's like, no, but but that narrative we've created is a narrative that doesn't acknowledge the reality of these other people. And so we're going to need to create a scientific narrative that has space for multiple realities in it, for multiple subjective realities in it, and doesn't just try to impose the subjective reality of, of us as scientists and market that off as objective onto the rest of humanity if we want to, to get anywhere, if we want action to happen. So yeah, that's my spiel. <laughs> Well, so how do we how do we do that? Wait, can I can I throw in another question? Because uh, the dual narrative that I heard uh, in uh, what Mel was saying, like, okay, you have these people who may or may not have voted for a person who basically threw science out the window in uh, interest of economic prosperity. So. Can you have economic prosperity and environmental prosperity at the same time? Because I think um, there is a narrative that you can only have one or the other. You can either have a coal fire plant that's polluting the, the, not the, the environment, or you can have a solar plant. And I, I don't know. Like there's a, there, there seems like there is um, a polarized view of economy and environmentalism in our country and it's and it's like you either have one or the other or you only have trump or you only have obama and there's these there's only two visions or, or whatever you know what i mean so it's like kind of where where do these dual narratives sort of come together like how can you find environmental prosperity um with economic prosperity you know what i mean like how can you have that balance and you know because i think a lot of what people who may or may not have, you know, who voted for Trump may think like, okay, well, I agree that we should be preserving the, the environment, or I agree that climate change is real, but I need a job. So, I don't know. Yeah, well, I think there... Yeah, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lags. You know what? <laughs> um, yeah, well, there's... There, there's Vox did a really interesting uh, video with this Tea Party woman. I can't, I can't remember her name. Uh, one of the founders of the Tea Party, who's actually a very vocal environmentalist, um, and and she she has this this narrative, which is like the the way that liberals are are talking about climate change is all wrong, and she'll she'll use terms like energy freedom. And and you know various like you can use like this this individualist uh, ethos to talk about conservation uh, that that may resonate with with people that that have different ideas and we because we have we've got all of, all of these various political issues that are bundled together for for the sake of voter blocks but there's no like real inherent reason why those bundles have to have to be what they are. Conceptual gerrymandering. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The word gerrymander comes from a Massachusetts senator and um, the word salamander. <laughs> Just bio, oh, nerdy uh, bio. Let me rejoin the conversation. You need to give the okay. Interesting. I just got an email from Mazin. Uh, I'm sorry. I will. Uh... Control room. But yeah. Um. Max, to continue on that same line just briefly, um, I think that it is played off as some kind of irreconcilable 
difference and, and what hurts, you know, often it's, it's like what hurts poor people and what hurts indigenous people is also what hurts the environment. But the way that power structures have overtaken indigenous people and poor people and the environment is such that oftentimes you can't hurt one without hurting the other, or there's at least the appearance that you can't hurt one without hurting the other. Um, like I was having a conversation about cigarette smoking last night with people who were just saying, you know, well, why doesn't everyone just, you know, it's, it's great that they're banning cigarette smoking on school campuses. It's great that they're, that they're upping the taxation on cigarettes, that they're um, making them harder to buy because it's a, it's a, a terrible health problem and it, it should, you know, people should just stop smoking, right? Um, I'm saying, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, and it's often the poor people who are smoking. It's, it's not the upper classes anymore. Um, and they've been bought into, is it working? Um, I think no, we need to, unfor I'm, getting, I'm getting strange emails from Mazen. I don't know what's going on. I think we need to end this broadcast and start a new one, unfortunately. Um, so, so <laughs> thank you for bearing with me. Uh, I apologize for all these issues. So I'm going to stop this broadcast. I'm going to send you all a new link, uh, in the next 30 seconds. And if you could just X out this window and go to a new one and hopefully Mazen can join that. Okay. Great.